So I'm going to try to talk louder. <laughs> so um, I'm guessing my next guest needs very little introduction, um, but I'm going to do the work anyway. Laya Abril is a research-based artist working across a variety of mediums from photography to text and sound. Her works of, uh, investigate often overlooked topics linked to gender equality and representation, sexuality, body issues, and institutionalized violence. After completing a five-year project on eating disorders, Laya Abril embarked on her trilogy, A History of Misogyny, the first chapter on abortion, we met before and in the exactly the same setting to discuss that work, was exhibited in 2016 at the Rencontre d'Arles and was subsequently published by Dewey Lewis to much acclaim for the sharpness of the work. We are here to discuss the second chapter of this trilogy on rape and institutional failure, which is also being published by De Dewey Lewis in a much larger forward for format than the previous one. The project focuses on the power me mechanics at play in both social, cultural, and political ways that enable rape culture uh, to continue and per perpetrators to be unpunished. Just like the first uh, work, uh, it's obviously a tremendous uh, and very difficult work uh, of research, so it's impossible to present in only 15 minutes, but bear with us, we're gonna try to <laughs> go right to the topic. So uh, it follows the on rape, follows a similar uh, red thread, yeah, it's already playing, then on abortion and its construction with a vast research of uh, different layered media, presenting text, interviews, objects, testimonies, and photographs. Now, looking at the scope of rape culture in uh, history, media, and different culture across the globe, how and where did you start your research for this visual essay and what was the starting point? Hi. Hello? Yeah. Hi, hi. Thank you everybody for being here. Thank you for having me. So, you know, it's interesting because when I was doing on abortion, my focus was on putting and visualizing something that it was pretty much not happening in the media. You know, illegal abortion was not part of the conversation back in 2015 before the Me Too movement. Um, so when I was starting on rape in 2017, actually, um, this topic was making the cover of the newspapers because we have the Harvey Weinstein case, we have uh, the Me Too movement happening. So why I would choose that as a second chapter if, you know, my, my goal was talking about something that no one was, was talking about, and in this case was not the case. So what happened is that I started to look about how we visualize rape on the media. There was this very big famous case, I don't know if you know, in Spain called the Wolf Pack, La Manada, in which five men have gang raped a woman, a young, very young woman, and during the trial, they have decided that it was not a rape, it was only abuse, because there was a video, which is a very interesting thing because we didn't have videos before, and the judges had decided that by looking at the video, she was not struggling enough, so that was not a rape. So everybody got to the streets. Everybody was extremely upset, which is not very normal in Spain in regarding to women's rights. And then I realized we are putting a lot of pressure on the victims. We are photographing them and we are making their body to be the evidence of what's going on. What if we switch the focus and instead of focusing on these victims and you know breaking their vulnerability, their privacy and everything around it, we focus on the institutions that are failing us, like the the justice system, the, the, the rape cultures around us, like the church, the military, the, the marriage, like the society has built this perfect system. It's not really a broken system, it's perfect to do what they want to do, which is to have these uh, issues to prevail and, and not being punished in the, right, in the right way or prevented in the right way. So it's a meta project in a way because I thought a lot about how do we visualize these being ethical with the people who are involved. Um, it has a lot of uh, historical parts also and a lot of object. I'm also interested in like where did what was the it's so huge w the scope of it how how did you decide and by which uh, entrance door did you start with the project? So the testimonies are a very important part of everything every chapter and in this case I don't know if you've seen I decided to do this installation where you have a uh, real size images 
of the garments and the uniforms of people who have failed this institution uh, punishment, this institution failure and violence. And this way, these are also objects, and I'm making this sort of portraits of these, again, uh, military system, really, uh, Catholic church system, uh, school system, who is part of this problem. And then in terms of history, when I did on abortion, I was doing a comparison between the present and the past. It didn't make sense to do this here because it's not like, you know, it's the same in a way. So what I did is to use history in order to go back to understand the origin of these laws. So I actually found out one of the first laws uh, of rape was in the Bible. And it said that if you were raped inside the city borders, was it not your fault? But if, uh, sorry, it was your fault. But if it was rape outside the city buildings, it was your fault. The other way around, sorry, I will explain. Because if you are inside, you would be able to scream enough so people can come and help you. And when you are outside, because you're outside and no one can help you, then it's not your fault. So this started to trigger an idea of historical elements and op that the objects, some of work as a visual metaphors to make you understand all these origin elements of myths, of laws, of policies, of ideas that they are being there since the beginning of time and we still use them as part of our culture. Um, another part that's, that was already the case in, on abortion but maybe it's more visible in on rape is that you chose to depict no graphic violence whatsoever in your book, neither in the text nor in the images. And uh, I think it's a very political choice in a way that goes against the grain of like mass media journalism and like victim representation. Uh, can you tell me more about this choice and like how it also influenced the construction of the work visually and in terms of text? So with an abortion, in a way, I didn't photograph anything that visually was striking you because it was not about the abortion, it was about everything else around it. So there was about the consequences, no? Um, I, needed, I needed to have people facing the situation, I needed to have visuals of testimonies, because we didn't have an idea of what a woman who have done an illegal abortion looks like. And I wanted to demythify that and portray them in a very dignified, strong, uh, political way. But when going back to on rape, it's everywhere. Like, it's Game of Thrones, it's in every movie, it's in every series, and it has become something that it's almost romanticized by the media, and of course in documentary photography or, or, or photojournalism, it's actually been all around this pressure that I was mentioning about having the victim to be the face of what happened, when for me, the, what it should be portrayed is the one inflicting the pain. Obviously, photographing pro rapers or perpetrators is a completely different uh, story and is already a very complex thing. But what I wanted to visualize here were the institutions. So for example, we have a piece in the show and in the book, which is made of 3,000 ID pictures of priests from the Catholic Church from all over the world who have been accused and prosecuted for sexual abuse of minors. So that piece, where you can't actually see the faces because it's blurred, with the glasses blur, is representing the Catholic Church basically allowing this to happen for centuries. So for me, that switch of, of the pressure and, 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 and showing that violence behind those structures is much more important and much more ethical than showing a female body or like not even a female body, it could be any kind of other gender person, but in general, obviously, women's bodies being, especially in the media, uh, portrayed in, in that sort of scenario, which was nothing uh, I wanted to do with. Um, one of the uh, most major point of the research was also to unveil like the mechanics of the institution that are at play when protecting the uh, attackers and that invisibilize the survivors uh, of sexual abuse. I think you tackle that in the book by layering a large scope of various information from the myth, the object, the tradition, the uh, interviews uh, dating back from 100 years ago to today. Well, in your sense, what are the limits of the book medium to show a work that's so layered, multi-layered, and that tries to uncover basically something that's invisible? All the limits. <laughs> 
The limits are not only the book format. I mean, actually, this is born as an installation. That's the way I work now. I do first installations, then I do the book, then I go back to do the installations. The limit is in myself. I'm, I'm very ambitious in the way that I'm pretending to visualize a global transcultural, transreligious, transhistorical uh, perspective, which is almost impossible because I'm a white South European woman who has a limitation of being one person. So what I did here was I react to three, four years of research, and I share with you discoveries that in a strange way helped me to be more at peace because at least I understand why these things happen. If this is not happening just because. This law is not just a terrible law just because. There is an origin. And that's what, in a strange way, it gave me some peace. At the same time, you know, it's a big book. It's a very red book. And people are like, oh, this is a very big book. I was thinking, like, taking the space to actually talk about this, using this very uncomfortable title, putting it in a table, not being able to avoid it. It's not about something intimate and, you know, private that only for women to discuss. For me, it's something like, no, this is like, I want to hear. It was one strategy that they was trying to explain also how uncomfortable I was doing it, how much pain is around. And of course, I'm tackling an zero, 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 zero percent of the problem. And hopefully other people as they are, other artists working in the subjects um, are ap approaching aspects that I couldn't approach or I didn't approach or I didn't approach well. And so it's part of a puzzle that we all put together um, in a political art that we think that you know it's important to put the things on the table and the book uh, has a positive thing um, which is obviously text for me it's an extremely important thing and uh, so uh, <laughs> just for text um, and obviously the book format allows you to have a different experience in the sense we're actually having a show coming up in London next week and is it for me also a different experience? So the bo the both of them work together well in, in the combination. Um, what kind of obstacles, if any, did you meet <laughs> when trying to make this work? <laughs> well, many, yeah. <laughs> um, is this, it's very painful. Oh, ah, because the award is happening. Ah, okay. Uh, <laughs> sorry. sorry, it's a cognitive dissonance between talking about rape and people clapping and like my brain is like, yeah, rape. Um, difficulties, yeah. So obviously, uh, the testimonies, for example, is eight specific people who suffer from eight specific institutional violence. The thing is, you go to a statistics and the statistics are so massive, so many people, so big that for a long time I was very overwhelmed about it's massive. And also there was some kind of limitations that, you know, I can't, I, I, this is not going to change anything. I know it sounds very depressing, but it's not. Because in a way, as an artist, you say, okay, why am I doing this thing? I'm not a humanitarian, I'm not an activist, I'm not a, a doctor, I'm not a politician. So my impact has a limit, of course. So why would you spend your five years of your life, seven years, or I don't know how much, uh, doing this if it's not going to change anything? So then is when it makes sense for me to start to think about our role as people who visualize these things. And, and then it make a little bit more sense and everything started to be easier. Obviously getting access to these people, it took me two or three years. Obviously understanding the, the, the content, it took me also some time. But the main difficulties of this project for me were how emotionally deal with the meaning of doing it. Okay. Thank you very much, Laia. Um, I just had uh, one last question. Is that um, did the previous chapter on abortion influence the way you worked on, on rape and ah. things that you wanted to do or reproduce or not? Well, you know, I, I did on abortion in 2015, yeah. so it's been a long time. I was coming from documentary photography. I was actually trained as a journalist. So that project still has a lot of uh, elements of documentary-ish 
a uh, political art kind of transition. I think in this one, the fact that I allow myself to be part of the conversation by writing in first person, but creating these installations where the physicality are also more important. I am more in here, so it's transitioning. Obviously, there is a lot of like elements that they are similar to, and abortion is still part of a large body of work. The third chapter is going to be very different, but it's still going to be a transition. Because in a way, uh, you feel, you know, you are in a con continuous transition. Um, sorry, I just got distracted no by problem. there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so it, it is a continuation, but I do feel it very different. At the same time, I started this in 2018, and we are in 2022. So I'm already thinking on 2023. So it's very interesting to also look back at your own work, and even having a show next week, and understanding also how the world is changing at the same time. So it's, it's a whole very interesting, like, coming back circular process. By the way, we have a signing at 3.30 at Dawi's stand. <laughs> have to say it, otherwise, you know. God. But yeah. yeah and you have an exhibition. So this, this work will be exhibited and the exhibition will travel. Uh, so again. the exhibition has been traveling in their pandemic. I don't know how. <laughs> it was fantastic. Um, but yeah, we do have a show opening next week, or it's actually open, but we inaugurate next week. Uh, it's organized by the BNA Museum in London, but it's hosted at Peckham 24 Copeland Gallery. And we hope that we have more shows of this one and obviously for the next chapter coming up next year. Thank you very much, Thank Laia. Um, we're again coming up at the end of our time. Does anyone have a question for... I've seen that you had a very substantial book with a lot of works on it. And I was thinking, uh, are you doing all the job on yourself, the writing, the pictures and everything? Or you've been surrounded by people with uh, different talents to write it for you or with you during this book on, and the book before? So, um, on abortion was very insane. I did absolutely everything by myself. It was also a moment in which I have this opportunity to show it in Arles. Uh, it was very strange at that time, like a under 30 year old Spanish young artist with a topic about abortion got a solo show in Arles. So I said, okay, I'm doing it, but I have not yet done the content, which is a strange thing. Uh, so I did the whole thing in nine months, which was crazy. So I, yeah, I did the whole myself. I mean. I do work with designers. I, I do work with editors who obviously edit my text because I don't speak the language as a native person. I work a lot with fact checkers, who's people who check if what I'm saying is true. I do work on the field a lot with people who help me to find stories, like fixers, journalists, you know, on abortion. On rape, I have a little bit more of resources, so I could employ a little bit more people. And in this case, because for me it was very important to have someone sometimes in the middle between us, because it's, you know we have this thing in documentary photography. They have this thing about this idea of talking about someone's personal trauma could be cathartic. And talking to a psychiatric specialist in PTSD, she told me be very careful about this because you don't know what's going to happen after to that person. So I started to work with psychologists, psychiatrics, lawyers, humanitarians that would be in the middle of the conversations in a way translating my intentions in a way that it was not re-traumatizing them. So yeah, I, I, I work with a lot of people helping me in that process. I wrote myself, I have a couple of editors. Next one, I'm actually uh, commissioning text to experts because I want to change a little bit of that because it's a lot of work to write everything and take all the pictures. Um, I was uh, trained as a, a journalist. It's not my best tool, but I still love to write. Um, I mean, honestly, it's a matter of resources. If I had more resources, I would love to have a large team of people. Um, I mean, yeah, no, you know, I like to do things myself. I love to design and things like that. But at some point, uh, it, you have to delegate and collaborate. Um, I like to collaborate more with some talents that are more into academics or elements that are, you know, they are not at my reach. But in a way, also, like, obviously, designers and editors are, yeah, I part of the team. Thanks. Thank you very much, Laia. Uh, thank you for being here. And uh, so the book is now published by Dewi Lewis. So you, I encourage you to discover the work and to read all the wonderful texts and interviews that Laia has been doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thanks.